everyone, this is Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We are studying Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, one of my favorites, where we see the writer of Matthew, the tax collector, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, writing to the Jewish people, talking about a very Jewish Messiah, how Jesus fulfilled much of the Jewish prophecies and scriptures that prophesied and prepared the nation for the coming of their Messiah. And we saw that in chapter 1. We saw Jesus's lineal heritage, how he hearkened back to Abraham and David and all the wonderful patriarchs that are listed there in chapter 1 who are in his biological heritage as a Jewish Messiah. Uh, and there's so much scripture that was fulfilled there. And we also saw that he is also a God-man in that he is also the Son of God. He's flesh and bone and flesh and blood man, Jewish man, but yet he is also a God-man because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so the the entire book is written to Jewish people for them to recognize their Jewish Messiah. Now we, 2,000 years later, as Gentile Christians, many of us, benefit from this book as well because we learn many spiritual truths from reading this book. But, it, but this book was primarily written to Jewish people. And as we read this whole gospel, we will begin to see warnings and and admonishments that the Savior gives to that nation, basically that wicked, evil generation during his time, warning them and pleading with them to accept and believe him lest they suffer the wrath of God, which was coming in 70 AD. And we know historically that that happened. And I believe, and there are many people who believe that the 70 AD destruction of the city and the temple was a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecies regarding uh, Israel and many of the prophecies relayed in the book of Revelation. And that was the predominant view in the church up until the mid 1800s. And I did not know that until I did research and study. And I'm actually shocked that there aren't more teachers out there teaching this and I also have to ask the question, why is it that I've been in Bible study for years and going to church all my life and I never learned anything about the destruction of Jerusalem and all the horrible things that happened? Why didn't anybody teach that? Why haven't we been told all the horrible things and how much of that lines up with prophecy, especially the book of Revelation? I don't have the answer to that. But praise God for the internet. We now have the capability to get old books that have gone out of print and we can get commentaries from theologians that lived long ago who believed in the fulfillment of prophecy in 70 AD, which is called the Preterist View. So we have access to those documents now. We can go back and we can do a really thorough study so that this dispensational or futurist view that puts a 2,000 year gap in between um, the coming Messiah or Jesus coming, the crucifixion, and this outpouring of wrath that God pours out on, on Israel and the temple is destroyed and the, Jesus, and the city is destroyed. There's a 2,000 year gap that they put in the timeline that doesn't make sense and it doesn't line up with scripture. So I've talked about that in, uh, in the other videos, but anyway, we're going to continue on in chapter 2 and we're going to see more about this Jew, Jew, Jewish Messiah, Jesus, and how he fulfilled much of scripture. Um, so we're going to look to see about his birth. Um, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, we believe these wise men were um, astrologers, is what the Amplified says, but these were men who studied the stars, who watched the stars, probably from Babylon, probably got their training from the days of the Babylonian captivity when Daniel and some of his cohorts were taken into captivity. And um, they learned about Jewish prophecy. They obviously were watching the skies, watching the stars, looking for signs. You know, God says he has put the signs in the heavens, uh, the stars in the heavens as a sign to man. And the gospel is written in the stars, all the constellations and things 
all of that is a picture of the coming Lord Jesus Christ. So they knew about stars and they knew about the stars painting a story, so to speak, in the sky. And we can read about that in Psalms and all over the Old Testament, really, in the book of Genesis. But the other interesting thing is these are Gentile people. They're Gentile people coming from a foreign land looking for, expecting, waiting for the coming Messiah. I believe they may have well known about Daniel's prophecy, the 490 years. They maybe were counting up to the 483 years in that prophecy in Daniel 9. They knew Messiah was coming. They were looking for him. They saw it um, in, in the sky. And so they left their foreign land and they came to... Um, Jerusalem, which makes sense. That's the capital of the nation of Israel is Jerusalem, where the temple is and, and all of that. And, you know, we have a, at the nativity, we have a picture of the three wise men and a lot of people get upset. Oh, it wasn't three. It, you know, it doesn't really matter how many came. I believe there was probably a large entourage that came and um, it, such that we're going to read in a minute that all of the city of Jerusalem was little taken aback, but I believe there was a large entourage of people who came, and the point is they were Gentile people expecting and waiting and longing to see this Messiah, this King of the Jews, and isn't it interesting that the Gentile people were looking and expecting, but yet those living there in Israel were very ignorant. Um, very, very interesting. So they came to Jerusalem, these wise men from the east, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. So they knew male king, already born king of the Jews, his star was in the east, and we have come to worship him. So they knew all of these things based on prophecy and looking at the sky. They knew these things, and they were obedient enough and faithful enough to follow it, to seek after it, not knowing what they would find. They just believed that this king had been born, that, um, that uh, God had marked it in the sky, and they had come to worship him. And when, they, when Herod the king, now, now the logical person to be looking for this and expecting it and wanting to worship this Messiah would be the king of Israel, wouldn't you think? Well, when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Well, I believe he was troubled because he was obviously ignorant of this significant event, of a significant event had happened. And these wise men from the east and their entourage had come to worship this Messiah that is spoken about in the, in the prophets and in the prophecies. And the king of Israel is clueless. Well, this doesn't make him look good. And obviously, when people are ignorant, they become fearful because they don't know what to expect. And they there's an underlying trepidation that perhaps this is God and I'm on the wrong side of it. But anyway, Herod and the whole uh, city were troubled. And when he, Herod, had gathered all the chief priests and tribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. Well, shouldn't he have known he was the king of Israel. One of the logical places to have looked would have been Bethlehem, the city of David. And we know that Messiah was to be the offspring of David, but he didn't know. He had to call his scribes together and demand an answer. And they told him, Bethlehem of Judea, and thus it is written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And that's Micah 5, 2. So he got a prophecy. He got the, the his rule, um, his um, wise men, his own wise men and prophets to tell him where it was written in Scripture that Messiah would be born. They go to Micah. They find Bethlehem. And, um, and so this was told to the wise men that came from the east. Obviously, they didn't have this prophecy about Micah. They only had enough prophecies that got them to Jerusalem. But they didn't have that crucial prophecy that took them down to Bethlehem to worship the Messiah. And Herod, again, interestingly enough, had to almost browbeat it out of his prophets. 
I don't know, maybe they had to go dig back and find it. Maybe this is something they should have known, but they just had to dig in and find it. The point is very embarrassing that they did not have the immediate answer that was needed. Um, and so Herod, when he had privately or privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So they were questioned, but he wanted to know what they had seen, what they had observed in the sky. And then he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring the word again that I may come and worship him also. So we can conclude that based on the information that Herod got from these Babylonian wise men, we believe Babylonian wise men from the east, that the, the baby was probably a toddler by now. And so Herod, not doing the Snoopy dance, so to speak, that Messiah had been born, not overly excited. And we see even in today's times, people are were so excited about the little princess Charlotte born to William and Kate and how excited everyone was. Well, Herod's not excited. He's already plotting from the very moment that he hears about this king of the Jews born. A star had marked the birth in the sky. He's already plotting his death. Now, we see right there that Herod is the seed of Satan. He is the offspring of Satan that wants to destroy the baby Jesus. And we see that in the book of Revelation. There's a picture of the dragon who desires to devour the child as it's being born from its mother, Mary. And we know that's a picture of Israel giving birth to Messiah. But Herod here is a man is is standing in the place of Satan. He's the seed of Satan. He's the offspring of Satan. And this fulfills that prophecy from Genesis all the way back from Genesis 3.15, which we've talked about, that the seed of Satan would crush the heel of the seed of woman. But that seed of woman, the Messiah, the picture of the Son of God, would crush the head of the seed of, of the serpent. And we know when you crush the head, you kill it. You immobilize it. Um, and so Herod, being the evil instrument of Satan, conspires to kill the baby. We know that from history. We know that from Scripture. And so when they heard the king, this, these are the wise men, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. You know, there are a lot of studies out there on the internet, a lot of presentations on the star of Bethlehem, and there are a lot of scientists who believe that it was a planet and it was Venus and they have or Jupiter and they have all these different theories about what the star of Bethlehem was and you can actually go to NASA's um, NASA has a website where they use Newton's uh, Sir Isaac Newton's laws of planetary motion and they can through computers they can track what the skies look like at any point in history at any place on the earth and they can see what was going on and they have all these interesting theories and I believe all of that but I also believe based on these scriptures that even though these wise men tracked a star probably a planet they tracked it to Jerusalem and they they knew from what they saw it marked a significant event that fulfilled prophecy I also believe that there was something supernatural here that they saw over that house. A, a Shekinah, I don't know, a Shekinah glory, some kind of supernatural, um, celestial something that they saw. And it was so different from what they'd seen before, and they were exceedingly joyful. They knew, they knew that they had found this Messiah, and they were... Um, so joyful. I mean, that is a picture of the Gentile church, the Gentiles who would accept this message, receiving it with joy. The religious people, the, the, the unbelieving Israel, the hard-hearted Israel, angry, conniving, conspiring to kill, to put down. We see that was true all throughout Jesus' life. Everywhere he went, the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Those who were looking for an answer, looking for God, embraced him with joy. So we see that from the very beginning, even before he's born. And isn't it interesting that God marked his 
birth and and his conception in the sky i mean that is so fascinating to me um that god did that just such a wonderful thing um so when they came into the house they saw the young child with mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him and when they had opened their treasures they presented unto him gold uh, gifts gold frankincense and myrrh so we see that the baby is now a young child a toddler Historians believe that Jesus was probably born in 4 B.C. and that Herod died in 1 B.C. So he, um, maybe he was 18 months, I don't know, a um, year and a half, but he's a toddler. And we see that these Gentile wise men that have come from Babylon ha are opening up their treasure sacks for the Messiah. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gifts that are fit for a king. Gold was the instrument, or, or actually the metal that was it signifies royalty, but we know that in the temple, all of the elements and all of the instruments were overlaid with gold, the menorah, and, and all of that. Gold, it was so important. Um, it shows uh, the glory of God and and the, the regal nature of God. And then you have frankincense, which represents the priestly gift. The, the priest would burn the incense as a sign of the prayers of the people, burning incense to the Lord. And then myrrh was a, um, a spice, an ointment that was used to anoint the dead body. So you see a prophecy right there even in the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. So much richness here. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Well, it's very interesting that, again, we have... Um, these wise men, we don't know how many there, there were, but these wise men hear from God. And they heard from God in a dream. We see God speaking to them in a dream, just like he spoke to Joseph in a dream earlier, where he told Joseph to not put Mary away, to, to receive her as his wife, to take her as his wife, and to marry her, and to raise this baby as his own. And he obeyed that. He believed in a dream. And he, he heeded those dreams. He was a prophetic man, even though he maybe wasn't standing in the office of the prophet. But he was a prophetic man. We see these Gentile men, these wise men, hear God's voice. They hear it through a dream. They heed it. And they go a different way. You know, God has to speak to people to use their comings and goings to... To fulfill his plan. The baby Jesus was born uh, as a God man, but yet he looked just like sinful man. He was a normal baby. A normal baby, even though he wasn't normal. He was without sin, but he grew up in a normal family to the point where his own brothers, when he grew up and became Messiah and declared himself Messiah, they mocked him and they, they just thought, well, no, and and his own family and his own kinsmen in, in Nazareth, they thought, well, this is the carpenter's son. Who does he think he is? Um, you know, and and so, but yet, um, these wise men, um, they hear the voice of God and they heed it, even when it doesn't make sense to their mind. I mean, they may have been shocked when they got to Jerusalem that all of Jerusalem was not celebrating this birth of this Messiah. They may have been a little flabbergasted, or maybe not. Maybe they saw in Scripture that Israel would reject. I don't know. We don't have enough answers. All we know is they listened to God, they followed, they found, they praised and worshiped, then they listened to the Lord again, they heeded the warning, and they went a different way. And God used that to protect the baby Jesus. He's a normal seemingly normal boy growing up in a normal environment and he needs people around him to hear from God to protect him. You know, he wasn't always protected by angels. He was many times protected by those around him who were godly and righteous to hear the voice of God and to heed it. And he was protected in that way. And we're getting ready to see that his father, again, listened to the voice of the Lord and protected him. Um, so it's just very interesting that you have these Gentile people coming to worship him and to 
open their treasure sacks for him and uh, and to do it in a, a way that that confounds and bothers the town and the king of Israel and yet the people in the town and the king are desiring to destroy the Messiah I mean you just see it right from the beginning and you may ask why why would Herod want to kill the baby well, we can come up with a million different reasons but the bottom line is that Herod had given his heart over to Satan and we know that Satan wants nothing to do with the Messiah Satan wants nothing to do with grace Satan is all about the law and religion and the harshness the cruelty and the, the stony condemnation and death that comes from the law okay so we're going to continue on in verse 13 and when they these wise men were departed behold the angel of the lord appeared to joseph in a dream we see god speaking to joseph again in a dream saying arise take the young child and his mother and flee into egypt and be thou there until i bring thee word for herod will seek the young child to destroy him and when he arose, Joseph arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed in Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. And that's Hosea 11.1. 1. Fulfillment of prophecy. Joseph had to hear the voice of the Lord again in a dream. And then he was told, Go down into Egypt, wait there, wait there until I tell you to come out. So he had to wait for another um, word from the Lord. This is a man who heard the voice of the Lord. If Joseph, who lived before the cross, had to heed the voice of the Lord, even if it came in dreams, how much more should we, born again children of God with the Holy Spirit living inside of us, how much more should we not heed the voice of God when he speaks to us and believe that we're hearing the voice of God and obey it? And we see that was very important in preserving the baby Jesus. Go down into Egypt. And you know that Herod did not know where um, Joseph had taken Mary and the baby Jesus, the toddler Jesus. He did not know. Satan does not know everything that God knows. He knows what he's been told. He only knew what the wise men had told him. He diligently inquired of them about that star and when it appeared. And based on that information, he acted. See, he doesn't have all this information that God has. He doesn't have all the information that God was relaying to the wise men and to Joseph. So we need to keep that in mind when we talk about what the enemy is doing in the world. The enemy is not operating with a full plethora of information the way we are, contrary to what many people believe. He is not. He's only able to use the information that he gleans and he learns from people. That's what I believe, from people. People have to talk and share and tell. And then he takes that information and he uses it. Um, so Joseph, again, very obedient. Save the baby Jesus, a fulfillment of scripture. Out of Egypt shall I call my son. Well, we know Israel, the nation came out of Egypt when it was in bondage and, and Moses brought them out. But that was also a prophecy of Jesus Christ that one day he would be called out of Egypt and he would come back to Jerusalem as Messiah. Um, so then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken of Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, it would not be comforted, because they are not. That's a fulfillment of that prophecy. And that comes from Jeremiah 31, 15. So right there we see the enemy, Satan, his offspring, the seed of Satan, King Herod, angry, foiled by God. The baby Jesus has slipped through his fingers and he's foiled and angry. And so in his wrath, he just destroys all the babies, the male babies, two years old and under. A great slaughter. Can you imagine what that was like? Can you imagine the horror? 
of that going on. Um, we hear about all that in the news with ISIS going in and killing children and doing all these horrible things. And it's so horrible that we almost have to turn our head and just say, oh, I can't think about that. But this was going on in Israel. Um, just the horrible things. And it was a fulfillment of Scripture. Many people suffered because of the rejection of Messiah from the very beginning. Many people suffered needlessly. Those people lost their children needlessly. The king could have accepted the Messiah. The, the rulers of Israel could have accepted Messiah, but they didn't. And a lot of the hardship that has come on them has come because of their rejection. These people suffered needlessly. Jesus was spared, taken down into Egypt, protected, and when the time was right, he was brought back out. We see fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and scriptures from the very beginning. It's just, the, again, more signposts, more signposts, more signposts to the nation of Israel that Messiah has come. Fulfillment of all these prophecies. And then when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. <laughs> so again, he's using, God is using dreams to speak to Joseph. It says, arise, take the young child and his mother. So I don't believe he, they were there that long. Maybe they were there a year and a half, couple years we know that Herod died in 1 B.C., Jesus was born in 4 B.C., so maybe a couple of years. Take the young child and his mother, go into the land of Israel, for they are dead which sought the young child's life. And he arose, took the young child and his mother, came into the land of Israel, and when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, this was Herod's son, he was afraid to go hither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream, another dream. He turned aside into the parts of Galilee. We know there's prophecies in the Bible about Galilee. Um, that's going to be in Isaiah and 11.1. Uh, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth. And we know that they were from Nazareth. Mary was from Nazareth, Joseph, and that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. I looked up the word Nazarene, and it means branch, root, separated one. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. So this is a picture of the large sprout the branch, the, the root of Jesse is what he is called, the olive tree that comes out of the roots of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, that, that, uh, and, and then even the mustard seed, it starts very small, but then it grows into a large, large tree. And so we see that right here, Jesus fulfills that prophecy again. He grew up as a tender shoot. He's the root of Jesse. He's that olive tree. He's the branch. We, we read in um, uh, Zechariah, the branch that is snatched from the fire. He fulfills all of those prophecies. And it's another signpost that Messiah has come. And for those who know the law and know the prophecies and know the scriptures, those scribes and those Pharisees and even the king of Israel... For those who know these things, there is no excuse. There has been one sign after another sign after another sign, not to mention the Gentiles that are coming from the east to declare it, the signs in the sky. See, there's no excuse for anyone who follows the signpost. And so we see God laying out a very convincing case from the book of Matthew that the Jewish Messiah has come and what a glorious and wonderful thing it is and so if we follow these signposts we come to a place where we say jesus came jesus is a fulfillment of all these scriptures i want to give my life to him i want to know him i want his power residing in me i want to walk in the authority he's given me i want to do all the things he's called me to do i want to go on this great adventure and be part of his body the temple of the holy spirit so there's just so much here 
again, a Bible, a wonderful Bible study teacher, a lot of you out there may be Bible study teachers, you could go through and you could pick, pick out a million other things in here because this is the deep, rich meat of the Word. And you could find so many things, but they all point to Jesus Christ. They all point to Him as Savior. They all point to Him as the Son of God. Fully man, but fully God. He's a wonderful, glorious Savior. Keep studying these scriptures. Keep meditating on these things. And we'll come back and we'll look at chapter 3 and we'll see about his baptism by John the Baptist. That was a wonderful day. So have a blessed day. We'll talk next time. I'll see you. Bye-bye.